Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. This episode of the Marco Martins Revolution is brought to you by Vodcast TV, Johannesburg's premier shared podcast studio platform. If you've ever wanted to host your own podcast for yourself or your business, there's simply never been a better place to do it than right here. Visit vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution right now and get yourself a discount on your first order of a podcast or podcast series. My guest today is Laura Gear, Johannesburg-based visual artist. Uh, who has a lot more to it, which we're going to dig into through this episode. A revolution is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power. An organization which occurs when the population revolts. The Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're really so excited to be here. Welcome. So when we <clears> spoke <throat> initially before starting, before deciding we should talk yeah. to each other on a podcast, yeah. one of the conversations that came up was about how visual artists in particular could earn income off of their art mm. and how sad it is is that so many people who are in the visual art space only remain there through passion so they don't right. earn a living right. wage then unable to earn a living wage off yeah. of their art um, and it's a really sad thing to see especially with so many employment opportunities being automated for so many other people in the modern age mm. uh, that art is one of our last remaining very yeah. human things that can be done. Of course, we'll discuss AR art coming. Oh, gosh. You know, that's the next thing. But just the idea of passion being the only thing that keeps people in visual art beyond the idea of obviously the extremely mm -hmm. successful visual artists mm -hmm. who are worth mm -hmm. an absolute fortune. That yeah. massive gap between yeah. the general everyday struggling artist and the absolute elite in the art right. world. Um for me, and the reason why I bring that up is the idea of how much how much beautiful art is kept from the world because mm. people aren't able to continue to pursue it or to yeah. put their correct energy yeah. into their art form. Right. Um, so, I mean, like, I it's, it's weird. So I've obviously, I've been in the creative space for, or like industry, I probably started around 15 and now I'm 26, so a good 11 years. Um, obviously there are many, many, many seasoned artists who are much more experienced than I am, who are just kind of in it, they've done well. Um, you know, they might have even been in the industry the same amount of time as me, but have had more opportunities and therefore more experienced. Um, I started in the music industry um, and I was, always, always, always said that I was gonna make a career out of music. Mm. Um, and I never, it's, it's something that I'm always kind of like fighting with mentally because there are many a time where I get messages and they've always got the best intentions, but mm. I get messages saying, you know, oh, like so disappointed that you're not doing your music anymore. Or like, oh no, you're, like, you're wasting your talent and like all those kind of things. And it's, it's always hard to, although they are sent with the best intentions, it's always really, really hard to receive those messages because I think people naturally glamorize the creative space mm -hmm. um, in terms of working in it. Um, and it, to the point where they think, okay, well, if you're super talented, you are going to make something of yourself. But there's, I mean, it just goes so far beyond that where – it's it's not about talent. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I was a really, really talented musician, but I didn't have the passion for it like I have with visual art um, to kind of keep me motivated. Um, because I feel like if you are going to get into the art industry and the creative space, you have to be uncomfortably comfortable with the idea that you are, if you are looking to make it your main source of income, you've got to be okay with starving and you've got to be okay with 
your lifestyle really, really, really taking not a hit, but you've got to be like almost very frugal. Um, and I'm obviously speaking from the point of experiencing the South African creative industry. Mm. Um, I've had very little experience outside of that. I mean, um, of course, look, the, the South African music industry is a lot smaller than yeah. those in the European yeah. markets, Australia, yeah. and then the US is the most mm. obvious one. Um, but then that's also more competitive space. The music yeah. industry is bigger, but there's a lot more people trying yeah. to feed into that music industry. Yeah. So there is opportunity in the South African music industry for South African musicians mm. to go on and achieve some sort of success. Yeah, It's also difficult anywhere in the world to be a minority mm. performer for like a, a small demographic audience mm. um, who could possibly listen to your music. Yeah. Right? So yeah. someone who shares your personal experiences. Yeah. And, Things like it's like why Taylor Swift is so popular globally is because yeah. when she started making her music at the age of fifteen or sixteen yeah. or whatever, when she well, when she started creating albums or recording albums with record labels and releasing it, uh, she was telling a similar story to English speaking white girls across the whole planet. Mm. And uh, I think that resonates with a lot of people. But then you look at the South African market, and of course, I'm not saying that it's easier for people in the South African music industry who speak to the majority because yeah. the, the majority doesn't necessarily have a buying power to create yeah. a career yeah. for you. I think Absolutely. this is the hardest part about the South yeah. African music industry is like there's not enough people in a demographic that yes. has the buying power necessarily. Yeah. And then as an English speaking musician, you competing with uh, musicians from all around the world, yeah. like the US and stuff. Yeah. And they, they established and popularized mm. and then glamorized on South African radio, TV, mm. Mm. the internet everything yeah um and then you've also got that added factor of that you, your audience is very small so now you have to try and speak to all of them and convince yeah. them like hey yeah how's about you spend some money on yeah. my music on my Absolutely. art so it's an incredibly difficult thing to do yeah um and then again what's what i was saying with the demographics that have like a larger audience is they don't necessarily have the buying power so it's very yeah. difficult to make a career there yeah and then the space is also extremely competitive yeah. with local music industry mm. uh in vernacular languages etc for example yeah. but yeah incredibly difficult industry um to make a living in though i think music is easier than visual art in many ways because there are other jobs beyond being the superstar solo artist performer. Yeah, I suppose You know, so. you could do like bar and restaurant weekend gigs that um, could pay the bills to an extent, right? So, uh, yes and no. I suppose, like I said, I think being talented is um, extremely glamorized. You know, I think you go to a bar and you say, okay, I'm a singer. And they say, okay, yep, you're good, whatever, cool. Come sing at our bar majority of the places and I mean most of my musician friends who I have kind of followed their journey and have kind of seen what they do majority of those weekend places you've got to play an obscene amount of gigs throughout the week to mm. make ends meet no, I and that unfortunately person. that is just the industry it is something um, that i did myself and yeah I yeah and, restaurant and like, gigs on a friday and saturday and it's actually extra exactly. income because it's a friday and a saturday exactly and unfortunately that is perpetuated by people who are musicians who have full-time yeah. jobs who want to keep doing it and yeah. get paid so they're yeah. able so they're prepared to charge very little to yeah. get that weekend gig because exactly. it's just extra money for That's them the thing. so it is very difficult but it is more yeah. of a possibility this is what i'm getting at than visual arts i feel yeah besides it's the idea of being a graphic designer mm. who's like drawing up logos and yeah. stuff is so difficult. I think it's one thing to be a musician playing mm. covers in a bar mm. and then not really doing your art, but you've got a passion for music. Yeah. So it's still a great way to earn a living. It's like a very happy place to be. You're still yeah. performing music. It's covers. Yeah. It's not your music. Yeah. It's not all those sort of things, mm. but it's a very happy place to be. In general, I think mm. with visual art, there's a very big difference between what would be the, the regular paying work for a visual mm. artist, which is uh, a graphic designer. Mm. And uh, first of all, a job that is done by many people who aren't yeah. artists. They're, yeah. they're graphic designers, yeah. they're professional graphic designers. It's very different to doing your own art. Yeah. So far less fulfilling than the cover band yeah. weekend gig yeah. as a musician. And that's the one point I, I thought maybe... Um. You'd want to elaborate on so, the sensation, the just the feeling of being a visual artist trapped in I, this. I think I've been 
so I mean, like obviously, I can only speak from my perspective. Of course, that's all um, we ask. <laughs> that's all we ask for. Um, that's all we ask. For. That's all we ask of you. Um, I think that I have been extremely lucky with my art. Um, I have earned more from my art from like a monthly perspective. I've earned more from my art than I ever did with a good month of music. Mm. Um, and that's purely because I, as much as people love going to concerts and they love going to like bars and listening to live music, I think that there's something that people hold very close to them when supporting a visual artist mm. um you know the, there's a sense of pride in it right is that I've, yeah I've and then from you, a you local get something artist oh and then you keep from that token from them and you've you've got it forever however long right you it's decide not a, to keep it it's not a memory from a live concert exactly a exactly and show. i mean like mm. um i started my business i've always done art um my parents were ugh, I love them so much. They never like tried to send me to extra math lessons because I was never interested in that. <laughs> um, they sent me to extra art lessons from very, very young. Um, so it's always been something that I've done. Um, and so it's always been something that I've just done as a passion. And I've never really tried to bring the financial aspect into it until 2020, um, where I suddenly didn't have a job. Um, and as, you know, a lot of people faced that obstacle Mm. um and i needed to make extra cash very quickly um obviously like i'm sort of self-reliable um for the most part and um i needed to pay my bills and so i started kind of advertising that i was doing art and um it just so happened that my one of my first clients had asked for these realistic dog portraits and then I, it was like very weird and I suddenly became... That doesn't sound weird at all to me. Maybe I'm weird. <laughs> Maybe. I'd, I'd love a re- well, realistic I mean, like, dog portrait. Well, I mean, a lot of people love them. and, and so Of their own dogs? Of their own commu- I mean, no, 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 <laughs> just one off Google. Yeah, they just find a dog on no, Google and send it dogs. to me. That is the best idea ever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I may be tempted to commission some oh, artworks I mean, of my own dog. <laughs> um, so she messaged me and she said, you know, well, they've got these three dogs when it passed away it was her mom's birthday coming up and her mom is obviously like an obsessed dog mom Mm. um and she asked if that was something i could do and at that point i had no idea in terms of like pricing what Mm. i was meant to be doing you've never been commissioned for anything before yeah and and if i had it was like really simple Mm. like plain pieces it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy and i'd always just kind of put my art up on Instagram in terms of like my stories, like, oh, well, doodling on a Saturday night, this is mm-hmm. what I'm doing. So she knew I could do realism um, and she approached me with this project and I started and then when I had finished them and I kind of posted the finished product and I posted the video that she had sent me of her mom receiving the gift and she was like in tears and like hysterical and it was like just – the best feeling of receiving that. So I had posted that. Um, and then it kind of just took off. And next thing I was doing like baby portraits mm. and like more dog. And there were like a couple of horses in there somewhere. Um, and that's just kind of how I started building it. And I think because I started that way, instead of going directly into selling my own mm. original, like original pieces, um, I think that's where I got really lucky Um, and I was able to and have luckily been or still been able to have a decent, I don't want to call it income because it's not an income for Mm. me. Um, It's additional Mm. cash flow that Mm. just Mm. comes in and it's up and down and it's not predictable, but Mm. I have been very, very lucky to through word of mouth and through creating pieces like the dog portraits um, have been able to get into the industry and have a financial backing and I suppose financial um, motivation to stay in it. Um, But like you said, it's not the case for everyone. It really isn't. And like, it's one of those industries where you have to stay 
relevant and i mean like ugh, that's like everywhere mm. but i mean like if you're a doctor you're a doctor you don't need to be relevant you just need yeah. to be good <laughs> you know um but people dying all the time people dying like, all the time you know sick. there's a need for you <laughs> you don't have to worry um but the, even the, if you're a bunch of what's a cuban or colombian doctors during covid you can uh, come to south africa and do yeah. nothing you get paid oh absolutely i mean if you put a doctor in front of your name yeah people want to see you yeah um, you're absolutely right and yeah. it's it's extremely difficult for a lot of artists yeah. and, and obviously the saddest part is that a lot of them have to veer off including yourself as you said mm. it's extra income for you so you can't commit yeah. all of your time to yeah your art yeah um but at least you creating enough income mm. to keep you motivated yeah. i suppose because it's one that's one of the hardest factors is to stay motivated motivated by yeah. passion alone well so especially with art supplies being quite expensive it's one thing to be a musician no, are they no, not no no, no. Not surprisingly i don't want to say that because i don't want my clients um, to think that i'm like you know but you're paying for my time if you're, a client, you're paying for my listening. you're paying for my time <laughs> um but it's and i think i've i've come to realize this over the years um I didn't carry on with music because I didn't have the driving force that a lot of musicians have. And I was always like, but why am I not like them? Like, why am I not as motivated? It's because although I was passionate about it, I felt that putting the label of this is my career, mm. I felt an immense amount of anxiety and pressure around doing that. And the way that I am personally wired, if I feel pressured from a financial point of view, right. I lose interest very, very quickly. Mm. Um, so I made the conscious choice to get out of the music industry because it was no longer feeding me. Um, and to be honest, I, I mean, like, I've got terrible stage fright and um, it, I did it because I was like good at it and not because I was like, I loved it and I was passionate. And I think that's the thing is like, I did not have that passion in it to ride the mm. wave and ride the struggle to a point where it could be viable. Um, whereas art for me, when I'm creating a piece, it's really just me sitting and like, it's just honing in, it's doing something that I find calming. Um, and because I've got my day job, the financial responsibilities and the financial anxiety just completely falls away. I'm doing it because I love it. And even if I wasn't getting paid for that piece, mm. I'd be okay. Um, and I do often think about like, oh, well, it would be so great to make a full-time career out of it. Um, but it's just unfortunately mm. the industry. And in saying that, I mean, this this whole conversation and this is something I'm on about regularly is that yeah. people will go and write stuff on Facebook and then yeah. not motivate what they're saying and they'll, they'll, they'll stop where we've just stopped now. Yeah. Is, yeah. It's sad that we're missing out on beautiful art because because mu artists or musicians yeah. or uh, actors, whatever, we're missing out on their beautiful art. We're missing yeah. out on the potential of this world having exposure to more yeah. of this art because they don't earn mm. enough or, or like at least yeah. just basic income yeah. to support that. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, the reality is how do you change that? And it's like you can't pressure society yeah. to now take on – everyone who's an artist whether yeah. whether you like their art or not whether mm. they're busy learning mm. or not while they're busy mm. like honing their skills yeah. or not yeah. it's like oh just support local artists like how like, why? why why should why i, should I? Yeah, exactly. exactly that's exactly. the thing so i think that's an important point for yeah. me to make out is that i'm exactly that person who's who goes and moans at people who just yeah. say oh they should be the, the like how like how? Tell me how. What are you, what are you yeah, gonna do? What are you gonna do? Yeah. So I think that that's one of the key points. It's like, although it's extremely sad that artists and musicians mm. and things can't mm. just can't just make their art and yeah. can't just go about their day doing that and earn yeah. enough income of it at a basic level. Um, you know, ensure that your product or your service, your art in itself, mm. is desirable enough to create the yeah. business out of it yeah. right? and, yeah. and there is still an industry it, it's difficult and it's going to mm. take a lot of tears and hard work and mm. sweat and mm. blood and everything in between uh but there is an industry there it does exist it definitely exists um but i mean like one of those things that come with being a creative or being an actor or being an artist or being a musician um you're not 
just doing a job. You're not mm. trying to convince someone that you are good at your job because majority of the creatives in the industry are good at their job. Um, you're convincing someone to like you and buy into you. It's not like an accountant where, I mean, I suppose you've got to like your accountant. I know, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to step on any toes, but it's, it's not like an accountant if you're an where accountant this is. To this right now. <laughs> Laura says you're incredibly, incredibly boring. Oh, yeah. Yes. You're not unique. <laughs> you're I'm completely just, replaceable uh, <laughs> and your client could just go to any other accountant <laughs> and get equivalent service at any given time. This is I'm a direct just saying quote. if you are an accountant or like we were saying earlier, a doctor or provide a service. A more that, traditional. A more, yeah, a more traditional, uh, you know. More widely um Offered service. Yeah. That you, you've yeah. just, you've got to be good at your job. Um, it's definitely a less personal service. It's it a, is. Accounting is a less personal service it really than is. a waitress at a restaurant. Exactly. It, it just simply um, is. They are, they are personal yeah. relationships developed in any industry. Yeah. But it's certainly a lot less than that and then art. Exactly. Even exactly. Further. So, I mean, like you've also, and especially now with kind of the, like social media being a predominant factor mm, in right. in the creative space mm. you are selling yourself as a product as much as you are selling your art as a product um mm. that is interesting yeah and it's i mean it's um it's upsetting because obviously or not upsetting i don't think upsetting is the right no, word. i think it's a very good thing because ar art is getting extremely good really fast yeah so if you're not able to attach personality to exactly. art and, and humanize yeah. it yeah uh, you will become redundant very quickly because yeah and you've, you've also just got to kind of make sure that you are staying relevant because the world where it is right now um, is extremely fast paced. Mm. And whether it's trends, algorithms, everything is changing at the drop of a hat. Um, and to be able to create a space where you've got a, a loyal following, but also a following that converts into customers and mm. loyal customers, um, it's... Uh, if you can find that kind of like comfortable spot, that is, that's the sweet spot mm. um, is kind of creating your space, creating your following, finding your niche and analyzing that market and seeing where those trends lead. Because if you're looking at, I mean, I know myself, I've got severe ADD and if I see something that I like in that moment, I'm likely going to try design something like that. Or like if I see that's trending, I'm likely going to try. So for me, one of my things is like staying true to my, my niche. Mm. Um, I understand. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you with a couple of things. Number Stunning. one, if you are currently an illustrator in the art space and you're getting your income off of illustrating children's books, yeah. for example. Yeah. Uh, try and adapt and do something else as fast as you can because AR art is going to take over that space like crazy. An author's yeah. going to be able to plug their book into an AI engine. Do you it's going to so? cost them. Oh, absolutely. The squirrel went into the forest. There's a squirrel in the forest in five seconds. The AI has drawn the squirrel in the forest. Okay. That's a terrifying place to be as an illustrator of children's books yeah i think you I will imagine. be redundant pretty um, fast it's so funny my dad's actually just written a children's book and he asked me to do the illustrations well good thing he's both like slightly older than you and probably uh, doesn't have an intense knowledge of ai art number one yeah. number two i'm sure oh, he has actually, some I, would say, I mean my dad's like so my parents had me very late so uh, um like very late my like my oldest brother's 20 years older than me Oh, right. Um, <laughs> Shell, the Shell last though. shot baby. I am. I don't know if I was an oopsie baby. <laughs> but no, you might have just been the last shot. Like, yeah, yeah. Go. Like I, I think about it every day. I'm like, was I meant to be here? <laughs> A little existential crisis every day. Um, but I mean, my dad's pretty like on top of technology. Um, but I, I agree. I think someone showed me, who was it? Someone showed me the other day. Um, they put like a bunch of words into an AI art developer yeah. and out came this beautiful, gorgeous piece of art. Stunning. In, in, in 30 seconds. 30 seconds, maybe less. Fantastic. Internet speed was... And, and you've got like seven options. Um, yes. 
Literally. Hey, have you seen that? It's a crazy. Yeah. Just don't ask it to do like a hand because then the hand is like, like 12 fingers like, or something. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. weird. But you can um, do like Joe Biden surfing on a naked stripper in the universe, like out in the galaxy. And the on computer's a wave of like, cocaine. please and say then it's less. Like, I know exactly what I'm you mean. A, I get you, dude. Yeah. Hang, I get you. Hang, hang on. on. I understand. I got it. I got this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Here are the other six options of yeah. what I've got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's wild. It is. Do you insane. want the stripper insane, riding Joe sorry. Biden? Because I can do that. I can do that as well. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> sorry, Joe Biden has twelve fingers on one hand, but <laughs> but he is on the stripper. The idea is good. Like the idea is there. Right? Yeah. And then there's a second version of. I think it's called Dali, okay. like like Salvatore Dali, but then like Wally from the. Oh, thing, I clever. think that's how they did it. That, that's very the, very clever. The very popular because it's from OpenAI. Okay. Uh, they're very cool. Yeah. I'm a bit geeky about that sort of thing. But in saying that, it's it's the that encourages that personalization of yeah. your art, right? It's yeah. like, hi, I'm a human being. This yeah. is my art. It's mm. an extension of who I am. Yeah. If you like me, hopefully you like my art and well, there's a value attached exactly to that, it. right? Is, I, I is, really like that. Yeah. And hopefully your dad stays loyal to you for the illustrations well, at least. Well, listen. And he doesn't like trade you in for AI. Disco Dave better stay loyal because... Disco Dave, I like that. Uh, Disco Dave. One was the the guy that was my matric dance Dave in obviously in the high school. Eight years ago. Eight years ago? Roundabouts. You're 26. 26, yeah. Eight years ago. What? I'm sorry. Oh wow, you've got a 10-year reunion coming up for <sighs> high school soon. I didn't go to mine. You didn't? Why not? Mm. I think I've got it. Like it wasn't a, the... No, not really. I actually like the people I went to school with. They're okay, really stunning. lovely people. I went Where to the National to school? school of the Arts. It was a really amazing place. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you've always wanted to be in this space. I always wanted to be in the creative space. Actually, I fell into this industry a little bit by mistake. I'm a musician, a yeah. drummer. And, uh, You're I a built, drummer? I'm a drummer. A drummer and percussionist. And wow. I studied classical music at the National School of the Arts through high school. That's and cool. And I um, started working at a music shop in Bromfontein called Tom Sun and Music while I was still in school. I was working there part time. Wow. And I was using my staff discount there to build a home <laughs> recording studio. Like I spent <laughs> more money the dream, there hey? than I earned. Yeah. Like, way more than I earned yeah. there. Uh, I was also a drum teacher at the time. So way more money okay, than so I earned. Okay, so you've done all, all, the all, all the things that come with things. being. And I was building a recording studio at home to make like a music recording studio. And then when high school finished, I got a job at another recording studio that did like radio stations and voiceovers yeah. and things like yeah. that. It was a financial opportunity mm. to branch into the voiceover space. And yeah. then uh, I initially was just behind the mixing console and the computer and then eventually fell behind a microphone here and then fell in yeah. love with that. Um, purely by mistake, there were a couple jobs that I couldn't get voice talent for. Okay. And one of the voice talents was like, why don't you just do it? You've got a good voice. And um, uh, I, I did. And like, I tried it. I think and they were exaggerating, kind of, man. But. They, they, they were being nice. It's called being polite. It's not called exaggeration. But um, <laughs> they, they probably were just being polite. Uh, but I think that was one of the things is that it's funny how things can work backwards sometimes. Yeah. Is that being a director, in a way, yeah. a voice of a director, gave me a lot of skills before going behind the microphone myself Absolutely. because I knew what I wanted as a director. So I was yeah. able to deliver that very yeah. quickly uh, with inflections and, and various mm -hmm. things. So that's how I got into this space eventually is because I, I branched into the radio space. I was offering personal radio services yeah. and producing radio. And then uh, I hosted a really great show called The Pat and Marco Show with my dear friend Patrick Hayworth on Stunning. one of the first big internet radio shows in South Africa when Gorgeous. internet radio was going to be the thing. Uh, okay. And going then it didn't. I mean, yeah. yeah, well, podcasting That's became the thing. Yeah, right? I mean, like, yeah. uh, so even though podcasting was around back then, the idea was that people wanted 5FM right. or 947, yeah. but they wanted it on the internet. Yeah. And they don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It has become very apparent that that is just not greatly convenient. Uh, <laughs> I think it still exists out there and things. We had a really great internet radio show on Two yeah. Oceans Vibe. Um, we were quite popular for a while. And then, uh, yeah, we stopped that. And it just made me think, well, this is this is the actual market, you know, mm. like having mm. learned from the internet radio space mm. that it's like, okay, that's not how this is done. Yeah. Uh, podcasting is going to be the space. Yeah. And, um, I think it's it's still coming in Africa. 
Yeah, still coming. I, I would and, say. And I think the YouTube revolution definitely. is still on its way, especially in Africa. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, that's how we ended up here. Stunning. I love it. So happy for you. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure. I wish you well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a so it sounds like an interview of me. <laughs> so I was born and raised in a, a small like, town. Oh, I actually oh, no, wasn't. I was born and raised in this town. In, in this a town. A very, very big city called Johannesburg. Me too. And then my parents were like, city girl? Absolutely not. We're going to Mpumalanga. Did you move to Mpumalanga? Pack your bags, girly. We're How old going were you? To, um, I was 15 Ish. Oh, I was right. No, that's a horrible time to move no. from the big city to. A I am so grateful we did. Listen, no. at the time I was like upset yeah. and I was like, "Mom, how could you do this?" My friends, my friends, <laughs> and it happened very quickly as well. Right. So I, I don't think I had like time to process. That uh -huh. was a good thing until we were there. Um, but I'm like really grateful because there's something about growing up in a small community mm. um, where although everyone just knows everything um, about you, mm. there's also an immense sense of loyalty. Um, and I mean, like, I know I could go home and like basically the whole town knows like what I'm doing and like, who I, and there's just uh. like this support, support. Um, you know, I always say better to be, actually, I don't always say this, but it's something that I think about often. Okay. Don't always say it. Better to be a big fish, small pond, than a, than a small fish in a big pond. Well, it's better to be a big fish in any size pond than a small fish in any size pond. Do you think so? Yes, a small Why? fish is horrible. It's horrible to be a small fish in any pond. Is it though? I feel like it can fit into more gaps. It's better to be a medium-sized fish in a small pond than to be a medium-sized fish in a big pond. Yes. I'm changing language better, i'm changing literature now forever better to under promise i understand and the analogy under deliver right as well then i think my analogy here and you know we're getting right into the the <laughs> sticks about fish right now yes like the nitty gritty right i think the analogy comes from being the same sized fish right is that what if that you're, we're the same size fish not you and I, oh, but no. the I individual in the small pond and the individual in the big pond. Right. You are a fish. You're a that fish. That is what you are. Sure. And you are of a specific size. <laughs> but when way. you are in a small <laughs> pond, right. you come up, you, the appearance is that you are a big fish. Yeah. You take that same sized fish and you place them into the very large pond. Right. They will be feel or seem or appear much, much smaller. Much smaller. Hmm. Absolutely. Even though they of equivalent size. Sure. Equal size. Mm. Different space. Equally sized fish. Equally sized fish. For those of you who are still listening to this podcast, <laughs> all two of you, um, welcome and thank you for enduring the most the horrible analogy talk. about fish. No, mm. I, I like that and... Uh, so, so you moved to this small town in Mpumalanga, Mpumalanga. amongst the mountains um, upon a beautiful yes, estate they're, they're, with horses. No, there was no horses on our blue estate. Blue cranes. Fact, um, occasionally. <laughs> that's so wonderful that I got at least the second one right, right away. Yeah, um, there were horses, but not where I lived. Right. So, I'm trying to just paint you as the spoiled brat. I'm I'm oh no. really just playing. It's, oh no. But it does sound lovely to um, have moved to the mountains. I do enjoy visiting in Pumalanga. It's Minus so the beautiful. sinus infection. I somehow Minus always the get a sinus I, infection in Pumalanga. My doctor knows. I mean, of course he does. But he knows that when I come to Pumalanga, I'm a thousand percent visiting him. Mm. Because my sinuses, mm. they're not having a good time. I don't know what it not is Not even about an the average place. time. They're having yeah. a bad time. Yeah. Uh, and it's I, just not every enjoyable. Time, every time I visit in Pumalanga, I come back with a sinus infection. Absolutely. And I have to go to the ENT. It's the whole thing. It's Yeah. And then if you stay in Pumalanga, you actually evolve. Right. You develop this. You develop uh, an immunity to it. It's like um, people in India can drink the water, right? But if you go there as a visitor, they? they can. Oh, thank gosh. Because otherwise they'd be very... I mean the tap water. I know, but that's But what you I'm as a visitor going to India should not drink tap water, from what I understand. 
very yeah. interesting. Your and gut microbiome would I'm a blonde girl, it. so I already have very bad stomach issues in general. Right. There's something about a blonde girl. With and then you've tummy got issues. light eyes, so it's just all of this. All of it. All of it. Too much time in the sun, can't see anything. Can't do it. We were in Cape Town recently and we had to take a lot of photos. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I was always facing the sun when someone wanted to take a photo of me. And to have to like, and then keep your eyes open. It, like I came back and I think for the last week, my eyes have been sunburned. That makes sense. You do have very light colored eyes. I but do. I, um, I tend to squint in photos in general anyway. On purpose? Like I d- no, uh. I'm just terrible at photos. I'm just that guy who's always like, you know, photo. I'm so sorry. It's horrible. I can teach you. Could you teach me how to post watch them? Do you charge? Yeah, it's my actual, it's actually my other side business is. um, It's your main income charging people out to pose for photos. That's actually it. Yeah. Right. Side business is art. Main salary is photography, but posing for photography. Are you a model? No. Oh, you're just teaching people how to pose. Oh, yeah. So you're like a modeling coach. You teach. Right. Those who can't do teach. Absolutely. I'm so sorry to my dad who's a teacher. You can do everything. He's literally the smartest. I'm not even just saying Will this. your dad listen to this though? Um, my parents are very like, they're sneaky. I don't want to say sneaky because that's the wrong word, but they like. Sneaky in a nice way. In a nice way. Like oh. they are sneakily just watching my every move in, with love and support, oh. but they're there. And but they won't bring it up. Sometimes they do. My mom's one for bringing things up. <laughs> she loves she loves to chat about things. So I um, loved you on that podcast. Literally, literally. They all they all but. they all see something before I see it sometimes. Like often like some articles or so, something from like my I suppose like the music side or mm. that kind of side of things will resurface or something will come up to do with that and they'll be like, oh, La, did you see that person posted your song? And I'm like Sorry, what? Who? So they know everything before I do. Um, they probably... If someone posted your song, you must go get paid. You'll be like, I want my money. Let me go find them. I'm just playing. I, well, Look, I, I was going to... Yeah, I don't know if I ever had the energy to do that. No, you can't chase everyone down no, for a little can't. bit of money on music. Plus, I'd it's rather very, have very people difficult. listening to my stuff illegally than not at all. That's nice. Yeah. Of course. I just yeah. want to be paid. Don't listen to my stuff. <laughs> go away <laughs> leave me alone go away leave me alone <laughs> come, your come, oh you don't have money come with money go away. or get lost <laughs> just get out of here okay so another point i wanted to bring up is this idea of creatives in relationships right and um beyond the idea of you having a stable uh day job in yes. a way, and then having the art side on the side because this is often one of the issues that people have with creatives in relationships is the disparity between your working hours, things like that. Mm. Uh, musicians who go on tour make it extremely difficult for people to have a relationship with them because their life isn't stable or set. Yeah. Um, and I think beyond that, so that, I mean, of course, this is one of the, the motivating factors for why these things happen. Mm. Uh, beyond that, I think there's a psychology at play of how creatives gravitate towards having relationships with other creatives. Yeah. Please give me your thoughts on that. So, I don't necessarily know if it's creatives gravitate towards creatives. Um, alone I think it's it could also be creatives gravitate towards someone who has a not a deep longing to be creative but someone who has a love for creative spaces Um, so I mean my the guys who I've dated in the past um, you know they've always been very very into the like the idea of the music industry or the idea of the art industry. Um, So they've been very, very supportive because there is a a love there for it. Um, My current boyfriend himself, he is extremely creative, extremely, extremely, extremely creative. Um, And that is one of the ways that we first kind of connected. Um, was that mutual love and I suppose deeper understanding for the creative space. So so you guys obviously connected on yeah. the creative side of yeah. things and that, that helped 
spur on the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Of course, relationships are a lot more than this. Than just, lines. yeah, than just kind of like more, relating. There are a lot of factors in, yeah, in how absolutely. people can have chemistry with each other and things like that. Yeah. But it certainly is a very interesting part of the human psychology is how, mm. gravi- how creators tend to gravitate towards each other and especially professional creators. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, look, a, a lot of the, the musos that I know, um, those who have been in long-term relationships um, are often with someone within the same space. Mm. Um, so, and yeah, I guess, you know, like you said, it is an extremely taxing um industry to be in um if you are especially, yeah. yeah music especially i think just recording artists who are like session musicians for yeah. recording studios so you can have like literally a day job exactly in your city exactly um i mean example my best friend is dating um a oh, film bestie. producer bestie my bestie for the resty. Um, she's dating a film producer who produces work for a very, very well-known South African visual artist. Um, and they they travel often. And it's a lot of it is last minute. Um, and it can be for very long. Um, and she is not in a creative space. She's a lawyer. Um, but that industry in itself demands a lot of physically being in the office and Mm. physically working long long hours so i think it doesn't necessarily have to be a creative dating a creative but more so someone who understands the kind of not implications but i suppose like the long hours the not being able to be home all the time the you know all those kind of aspects of it so it's more so just someone who has a deeper understanding of the responsibilities that come with a job like that. Yeah, I suppose we're not being uh, very fair to to all industries. Of course, there's civil mm. engineers who move away from home for years at a yeah, time to finish yeah. a construction project yeah. and uh, things like that. So there's mm. many difficult industries for people to, that doesn't yeah. help from a professional yeah. standpoint their personal relationships. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just purely the psychology of things is to you, the the. I mean, one of the things that you point that you brought up earlier was ADHD. Yeah, and it's surprising to me to hear how many people who choose creative occupations have ADHD yeah, or yeah. diagnosed ADHD. Yeah, and uh, I think that's one of the interesting points about it. And it's obviously becoming a more and more popular idea. Yeah, the idea of ADHD being treated with medication and being an illness and a mental illness mm, from mm. like really accelerated in the 1990s and you, you had people being treated for this yeah uh with ritalin concerts or whatever all the mm. various mostly ritalin and yeah. um now that education is sort of trying to evolve slightly with the times but at least thinking modern thinking and probably stems from a lot of young people who were treated for adhd right, and, yeah. and suffered the consequences of it like by over medicating it things like yeah, that to perform yeah. well in traditional schooling yeah uh, just because i'm poor at concentrating in geography class does that necessarily mean that i'm worse than another kid mm. and i need to be medicated to be mm. brought onto the same level as you mm. or is my brain just a different type of brain and and i will excel in other areas yeah did you find that for you yeah i mean like i went on ritalin in school um same z's same z's so cute um and i recently went off it again because i kind of just found that my concentration levels for a long time i felt guilty for taking medication for my add but Mm. um The way someone explained it to me was if you've got a headache, you take a panado or you take a headache pill um, and no one judges you for that. And obviously it's not a a long-term thing, but Mm. um, if you've got a chronic condition, you take medication for it. Right. Um, And it's similar to ADD. You shouldn't really feel guilty or the need to stray away from what helps you. Um, I really found that, that my medication in school helped me. Um, in terms of concentrating, my marks went up, my understanding for what I was learning went up. Um, yeah, it just, it really, really helped, but it, it 
did, I suppose, having it um, compared to my peers, my where I excelled was extremely different to where they excelled. Um, and majority of it obviously was in the creative space. Um, did you feel that the, the drugs inhibited any of your creativity? Did you feel that being on Ritalin? Mm. So, of course, there are personality effects. So right. This is the first thing that a lot of people point out is like, yes. oh, my child is not the same, you know, since being on the drugs. A lot of the time, less prone to being comical, less jokey, less fun. In a um, way, from a personality standpoint, right. this is common. Yeah, um, it's also very dependent on on the age at which the drugs are pres- prescribed. Yeah, so there's very specific age groups that excel mm, mm. in their brain redevelopment during a certain age period yeah. that often allows them to no longer take the drugs because it's repaired. Yeah, whatever issues, right, or factors in the brain. Um, in saying that. This is one of the issues with Ritalin, and I think this is the big war on mm. the drug. Mm. Comes from the issue where parents or teachers, in particular, couldn't deal with a certain child that they deemed a problem child. Yeah, uh, the easiest way to deal with them would to be medicating them. Yeah, and then that would just make their own personal lives easier. Mm. And mm. doctors over medicated a lot of children yeah. unnecessarily, created a bad rap for the drug. However, its clinical trials and its clinical success is massive during very specific age groups for very specific types of people. Mm. So, again, we've now met one of the people who have a little bit of a success story with it. Yeah. Don't dislike the drug and uh, don't feel guilty for taking it. Good on you. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, like I've witnessed what I feel like without it. Um, Currently, I'm not taking it. I haven't been taking it for the last like six months maybe mm-hmm. um but without it i do notice where my concentration levels are and um i heard a very interesting term for what i feel the other day and it's add or adhd paralysis so often people will think that um when you do have add you procrastinate from things that you don't really want to do or that you aren't interested in um or that you struggle to take an interest in something that you're not passionate about but for a lot of people with it it's also the things that you're passionate about Mm. if i am feeling particularly add (laughs) um i could sit for hours knowing that i have an art piece to do which i am dying to do or say i want to start a new book which i'm dying to do um i could sit for hours and just not be able to do it mm. and it is the the weirdest feeling and you feel super guilty for not just being able to get up and do it and unless you've got ADD you don't really understand that pull that stops you from doing things the best description of ADHD that I've ever heard was yeah. a um was a neuroscientist using a flashlight to describe it in a room full of items. Okay. And how normal brain activity works during so normal brain activity allows your focus mm. to be this flashlight. Yeah. Right. And you can adjust the amount of space, mm. the amount of light spread. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you have so a certain amount the, of energy right, right. that you focus. And to bring your focus in a concentrated space, you can focus on an mm. individual item in a dark room mm. because you've got this flashlight that's now focused. Mm. Now, normal brain activity allows you to adjust that mm. focus. So in certain times, like driving, yeah. your focus needs to be widespread. So you yeah. can't focus on something very individual and minute. Mm. You're trying to take in a lot of varying information mm. in small amounts right. so that you can process that yeah. and make decisions based on that information. Mm. And then in other situations, you're able to bring your focus down into smaller items yeah and the issue with adhd is the lack of the ability to close that focus yeah. of the torch so you're still putting the same amount of energy yeah out into focusing you're still focusing the same amount of energy however you're very distracted yeah by all of these varying factors around yeah. the room so yeah. instead of focusing purely on this fragrance diffuser You've now got this widespread of light that it's like, oh, that's a microphone. Oh, yeah. that's a plant. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Sound <laughs> wow. things. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, 
the, that was the best description of mm. ADHD that mm. I ever heard and, and it's visualized somewhere. If I do find the link, I will put it in the description below. Stunning. You've heard my take on creating a career out of or from a in a creative industry, um, whether it's visual art, music, DJing, mm. whatever it may be, um, which is basically like, un- unfortunately, you do need to, if you're serious about it, you do need to be very comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, what is your take on it in terms of building a viable financial? So I think, again, I'm going to just repeat something I said just to set this up and to set my thoughts up on this whole process yeah. is the idea of it being sad and upsetting that the world is losing art because it's so difficult to Mm. create an even small sustainable career in the art space. Mm. It also seems to be in visual art in particular, obviously music is one of the biggest differentiating factors in this, is that it seems to be reserved for people of a certain uh, economic base, Mm. people who come from a certain amount of wealth it's a lot of the time it's people of particularly wealthy backgrounds that mm-hmm. are able to break into the visual art space. Um, and then people of middle class as well are able to as well. Uh, and then poverty stricken seems to get into the art space quite a lot less. I'm not saying it's mm. the rule of thumb and it's for everyone. That's just statistically yeah. there's this, this big uh, disparity between the people of economic wealth and those who are less fortunate Mm. in early life and Mm. their ability to go on and make careers in the art world. Right. Having said that, I think there's obviously always possibility for people who are prepared to work hard and commit and be patient with a Mm. process Mm. that they understand and believe in themselves, Mm. especially if you're young enough. If you don't have Absolutely. kids, if you're not married, if you've got like slightly fewer responsibilities and you're 18 years old, instead of going and getting that shitty job that you hate just because you need to make some money because you want to buy Nikes, rather suffer a little bit, not mm. be able to party with your mm. friends, not be able to go out and get drunk, not be able to wear your Nikes, not be able to drive a Mercedes, yeah. whatever, just because you're not taking the job, rather suck it up, struggle a little bit, and go on and make a career with your art if that's really what you yeah. want to do. I think yeah. that's a great possibility. I think yeah. what's coming in the future, though, for human beings, and I think this is one of the exciting parts of the sad thing about people all losing their jobs in various ways mm. with the automation thing coming. And although we discussed AI art being an automated way of replacing the need for artists, I think what really is coming and even though I have a very limited understanding of the financial implication on economies and things like that, I think what really is coming with the growth of technology in the future is some sort of universal basic income. I think there's just no possibility of all the human beings in our world being able to be employed. I think that's going to slowly start going away with more and more automation as Mm. technology gets Mm. more and more uh, advanced. And I think that technology will take over the responsibility of human beings having to contribute to the economy. Okay. I think that will start to diminish how long that will take. Who knows? It could be 100 years, could be 30 years. Who knows? But I think that will diminish the requirement for human beings to be working a job in mm. order to get some sort of income mm. um, will diminish over yeah. time. So I think all people will be somehow, with the help of technology, earning an income without having to have a formal occupation. Right. This right. will free up people to be able to either A, be lazy shits, sit on the couch, right. consume Netflix, yeah. right? which is my future occupation. Stunning. I can't wait. So excited for you. I will be a lazy shit and not do anything. I'm so excited. Probably not. I'm, I might have to do something. I'm too itchy. But <laughs> in saying that, yes, sure, there will be lazy people who yeah. won't want to do anything, will sit on their ass and just live a comfortable life. Mm. Good for you. Mm. I think it will free up a lot of people who really want to do art because there's no pressure of the yeah. financial implications yeah. of not doing things. And you'll have a lot of human beings doing art. I mm. think that's going to be one of the things that we're going to do. I think mm. it's one of the things we all drawn to, mm. whether you're creative or not. Yeah. Uh, whether it's visual art, music, yeah. drama, 
whatever is making content and you can see it in TikTok because it's the easiest way for people to like create a little piece of art, even though they're replicating other people's art, or yeah. other people's ideas, yeah. other people's little dance moves, things like that. It's something mm. that people enjoy doing yeah, and they enjoy sharing that art. So I think that's what's going to happen to the art industry in the future. Mm. So those are my two views on the art sector, whether it be music, whether it be acting, drama, and all of these different sectors um, and visual arts, of course. Um, whatever you are passionate about, especially if you're young enough and you haven't created a bunch of expenses unnecessarily, you don't need to go take that shitty job. Even if you do go take that shitty job, when you get home from that shitty job, yeah. don't play Candy Crush. Don't yeah. watch fucking yeah. House of Dragons or whatever, which I actually want to start watching. Don't do all of that. And um, rather spend time on working on your yeah, art. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're living a very incredibly powerful time of the internet yeah. and social media that allows you to market your arts, market your music, Yeah, you know, between SoundCloud and all of these various places. Mm. You don't need a record label to buy into you for you to gain some exposure for your art and for your music. There are really great music socializing applications yeah. as well. One's called Vampr, V-A-M-P-R. Really mm. cool. It's like... Mm tinder for musicians <laughs> Stunning. so cool so it's like hey yeah. i'm a drummer i'm looking for other musicians for my band you go on to vampers like hey we're like, looking for a drummer come on you come know on. like that's really yeah. cool um so there's lots of ways to collaborate on art there's uh it, with people from all over the world which is amazing as well yeah. one of the things the pandemic accelerated as well so yes young people if you're passionate about it and you really want to make a career for it mm. it's going to be hard probably you might be lucky and it's easy I hope that for you. Yeah. But just don't create expenses. That would be my biggest piece of advice. Like try to keep your costs low. Absolutely. If you like want be to frugal be. Yeah. while you have the ability yes. to do so. Absolutely. Um, and just be aware that even when you do start doing well, there's a massive possibility in yeah. fluctuation of your income. So yeah. don't spend, even if you if you made good money this month, Yeah. still try and use that for the bad months. This Absolutely. is my advice for entrepreneurs and creators. Yeah. Because that's very good entrepreneurial advice as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the other thing is I'm looking forward to the day where income is less important to people so that we can experience more art. Mm. We might be oversaturated by it. We might not be able to see everyone's art because everyone's making art. So we might not be able to find the art we like. Hopefully technology helps us improve that. Mm. So... Yeah, yeah, but also, yeah, I also think like in, in saying, sorry to interrupt, but I think in saying that, um, I think that's why it is so important to find your your niche and your following and your community that you can, like I said, create not only a following, but a loyal following with. Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely like it's it's putting the work in regardless of what the results do. Yeah. I completely agree. Um I think that's a good time to cut it. I'd love to have you in again for us to discuss these views again in future. This has been an episode of the Marco Martins Revolution. Remember, it is brought to you by Vodcast TV. If you have ever wanted to record your own podcast for yourself or your business, it's never been a better place to do it. Visit vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution. Get yourself a discount on the first order of a podcast or podcast series. For me, for now, it's goodbye.